All right, we're back, and today's episode is brought to you by Manscaped. Spring has sprung, and our friends at Manscaped have the best tools for some spring cleaning. They've already helped you tighten up all of your body's basement, but this year, Manscaped can help you get the perfect presentation on that beautiful face with the new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Make sure you look your best this spring by using the code WISCG to get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code WITHCG, W-I-T-H-C-G at manscaped.com. Focus on the face and use the Beard Hedger Pro Kit for the cleanest look in the game. On to the episode, baby. Let's go. All right, we're back on the podcast, and I've been so excited to have this gentleman on the airways with me today. He's a neuroscientist, author, and one of the leading experts on anxiety, childhood trauma, and nervous system regulation. Dr. Russell Kennedy, welcome onto the podcast. Hey, it's it's really great to talk about what I love talking about. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, stuff I've been passionate about, and uh, to have this type of conversation means a lot to me, and to have you on. So thanks for joining. Hey, no problem at all. How are you feeling today? What's going on? Well, I'm just finishing uh, creating a mind-body program for anxiety that will be very different than anything the world has seen so far. So when you create something from scratch that's based on your own theories, I found it really stressful, actually. The last, <laughs> the last week or two have been really... Like, I'm not anxious anymore. I don't suffer from anxiety anymore. But I do, you know, I get some heart palpitations. I've getting, you know, more headaches than I normally get. I just had a massage. Like I said, you said you just had a cold plunge. So we should be, we should be on a nice level playing field at this point. But the last couple of weeks have been really hard, you know, because I, I have to film these things, uh, the audio component, and then do the meditation. So I have to get into this really, you know, intense kind of zone of kind of relaxation and concentration. And lately I haven't really had that. So I've had to really be able to kind of, Force my almost force myself into relaxing, which just sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's 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 something to be aware of, and the fact that you are aware of how you feel is mm -hmm. important, right? Yeah. So, um, I want to get into the first thing. I mean, anxiety is a big deal to you. You've had your experiences with it, so let's talk about it. I want to okay. learn about your experiences growing up with anxiety and how you've helped manage it, struggling with it your whole life, right? And how you've yeah. helped people too. One thing that you said, one quote I see is, anxiety is the alarm in the body. So I yeah. want to learn about all this stuff with you, man. Let's get into it. Yeah, well, I, I grew up with a, a dad who had schizophrenic and bipolar disease. So he was very unpredictable, even though when he was sober and sane, actually, I shouldn't say sober, he wasn't a drinker. Uh, when he was sane, he was great, loving, caring, attentive, taught me how to hit a ball, ride a bike. He was like an award-winning baseball coach in Ontario, where we came from. Um, but then schizophrenia really got a hold of him. And for me, uh, as a boy, you know, looking up to your, you want to look up to your dad, and he would just collapse at points. So it was really difficult for me to see the person that I kind of idolized just collapse into a heap, you know, every six to 18 months. So what happened with me is I kind of withdrew my connection with him because it just hurt so much to love him so much and then just see him in so much pain. So that created a tremendous amount of alarm in my system because I had one uh, impulse in me to love and connect with my dad and another one to withdraw from him. So I think anxiety, a lot of anxiety comes from having two diametrically opposed uh, impulses inside of us that we can't serve. We can't serve both masters. So we get caught in this limbo state that creates a lot of physiological alarm in our body. It's so true. And that's something that, I mean, something you touch on is being aware of the feeling in your body rather than what's in your mind. I would love for you to dive into that. Yeah, because I think, you know, most people think that anxiety is an issue of the mind, like it's a psychological issue of the mind. Mm -hmm. And the mind certainly plays a huge role in anxiety, absolutely. But I think with chronic anxiety, uh, I think it has much more to do with old alarm energy stored in the body that the mind reads. You know, Stephen Porges has this, um, Dr. Stephen Porges has this polyvagal theory, and he coined this term called neuroception. And in neuroception, there's exteroception, which is how the the mind and the brain detects the outside environment. And then there's this interoception, which is how the brain and the mind detect what's inside your body. And I think this alarm is invisible to a lot of us. We think that anxiety is actually these thoughts of our mind, but the thoughts of our mind, I think, are just the byproduct of this alarm 
that's trapped in our body and has been there since you've been four, five, 12, you know, 15 years old. So the brain through interoception reads the body and it reads that old alarm that's still stuck in there because it wasn't resolved at the time it happened. It's, I know for sure that was true with me, with my dad. And the left hemisphere has got to do something with that. Like the left hemisphere has got to understand where this is coming from. So what it does is it makes up worries and painful, you know, warnings, what ifs, worst case scenarios to make sense of this alarm that's in our body that we're not even really aware of. And then we attribute our pain to these worries when the worries are just basically a byproduct of this old negative fight or flight alarm energy that's trapped in our body. It's so interesting. And a lot of it stems from our childhood, like you're yeah, saying. Most of it. Most, most of, of it, it, for sure. A lot of people will come up to me and, you know, or, or come and see me in consultation and they'll say, you know, I was fine until I had the divorce or the car accident or whatever. And I'll look into their thing and it's like, were you? You know, were you really fine before this this huge event happened? Because I see people having having big events and not getting anxious after it. And I find almost universally that people have had some significant trauma that was never resolved and they've kind of tread water for a while. Mm -hmm. And then they go through a divorce or they have a car accident or they get fired or whatever, some huge event. And then that sort of opens the floodgates of this alarm that's been sitting in them that they've been kind of treading water with for a long time. And then that finally sort of trips them over to the edge. And then they get these, you know, impulsive, obsessive thoughts. And then they assume that it's the thoughts that are the problem when it's not, it's the old alarm that's stuck in your body. Right. And um, that's something I've been focusing on is being self-aware of those feelings and the alarm that goes yeah. off. Right. And, and a part of it, Dr. Kennedy, is it the inner child? That's in us, the child that's in us that maybe needs that attention, comfort, and love. I think so. I mean, that's basically the basis of my program is that, you know, you you had a um, trauma when you were young that was too much for your little child mind to bear, conscious mind, so it get repressed or suppressed, whatever Freudian term you want to use, into the unconscious mind. And as the body is a, a sort of a, a refuge for the unconscious mind, or a representation of the unconscious mind, the body keeps the score, a lot of that trauma goes from your conscious mind that can't be handled into the unconscious mind, and then it gets into offload storage into the body for long-term storage. And that's the root cause of what is feeding our anxious thoughts. So if we heal the alarm, if we heal that child, if we find that that younger self that's that was abandoned, you know, that was ridiculed, that was bullied. If we can find that younger version of ourselves, connect with them and resolve their alarm, that's what's feeding our worry. So when we resolve the alarm, the worries fade away too. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I want to ask, how have you managed these alarms that have gone off in you? So for me, uh, there's a number of things that I do. Um, breathing techniques are one, but really it's it's finding the alarm in your body. And that's what I'm creating the program about right now is how to find the alarm in your body. And for me, it's in my solar plexus. So I put my hand over it. I breathe into it. Um, I do this process called yoga nidra, which is kind of like this. Um, Andrew Huberman calls it uh, non-sleep deep rest. But for me, I use a lot of my training and experience in dealing with people with anxiety to make it a mind-body connection as well as an adult self connection. So anxiety is fundamentally um, a disconnection between the mind and the body. That's, that's, that's fundamentally how it starts. And then there's pain of alarm in the child's body. And as we get older, we don't want to feel that pain in the child. So we separate from that child. Yeah. So we push them away. And then, you know, if you push a child away who's in alarm, they're just going to get more alarmed. So yeah. we get more and more alarm, which feeds more and more anxiety. And then we start assuming that it's the anxious thoughts of the mind or the problem. So we go to CBT and we go to talk therapy and not that those things don't help, but you're not actually really fixing the root cause of the problem because the root cause of the problem is deeper. It's deeper in the unconscious mind. And that's where the the roots of anxiety are. And if you don't really treat the unconscious mind, which again is the body, the body keeps the score, mm -hmm. you don't wind up getting at the root cause of anxiety. So you're just kind of chasing your tail. So the little analogy that I use is it's kind of like having a rowboat with a hole in the bottom. 
So it'll fill up with water, which is pretty anxiety provoking. And then you can bail water out and make yourself feel a little better as the water level drops a bit. But unless you go under and feel and, and, and fix that hole in the boat, you're always going to be bailing water. So fixing the alarm in the body, healing the alarm in the body, connecting your adult self to your child self, that's how you heal the root cause of alarm. You can do other things. You know, you can understand, you can do mindfulness, you can do EMDR, you can do other things, but the root cause is this alarm in your body that's there because the child in you didn't get seen, heard, and loved and protected the way that they should have. And it's our job now to find that child in us and see them, love them, hear them, and protect them. Right. I love that. I want to mention three things I do for myself that helps me. Sure. One is obviously therapy, doing that and, and getting to the deep rooted things that I may not understand in myself that sure. I now understand. The second is breath work meditation. I want to learn if you do that, Dr. Kennedy. Yeah. I spend an hour each day doing this. And what it does for me is by doing the breathing techniques, um, it helps me get centered. Yeah. It helps me stay clear. But the most important thing is I'm able to feel all the emotions in my body. That's what's so important. And yeah. I'm, able, I'm able to cry at the end, to let yeah. it out, right? And how healing is it to cry? Well, I mean, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, who's kind of my mentor in developmental psychology, says that, that, that tears are a way that the brain adapts to a situation they can't externally change. So right. if your pet has died, if you're you know, going through a divorce, it's unavoidable. Your brain uses tears to be able to change the internal representation of what that means to you. So it's not that your the external situation is changed, but your perception of it changes. And that's what tears do. Tears allow the, the completion of what, what he calls the frustration cycle. So if we don't allow this emotion to come out, it'll just keep building and building and building. And it's kind of like this traffic circle. And what tears do is they kind of give you an off ramp from that traffic circle so that you can change the way that your mind and body perceives the event so it's not it's not seen so much as a personal threat to you anymore that's 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 a great way of putting it um and there's like you said there's so much stored in us that's suppressed that needs to come out right yeah and we're seeing that more and more all the time is like you know the body keeps the score it it stores this energy that that we can't process because ideally you know if you're getting bullied at school and you're 8 years old and you go home and you tell your parents and your parents tell your teacher and your teacher kind of modifies the situation so that that's not happening anymore the situation gets resolved but if you're afraid to tell your parents or too embarrassed to tell your parents like i was um or the situation doesn't get resolved that energy's got to go somewhere so it gets stored in your body I can relate with you on this. I want to bring it up. When I was a kid in elementary, um, I would wander off by myself. And there was a time where I was at lunch at the lunch table by myself. And I remember kids laughing at me. You're laughing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, right. and a part of that is kids want to fit in and, and there's insecurity oh. of that. And they want to, you know, do things like that out of their expense to make fun of someone. And it is what it is. It's out of our control. But yep. that's something that might have been like one, maybe one or three times. But it yeah. never leaves you. It never leaves you. Yeah. Right. And um, that that's an incident that I, I've worked through just through doing all this stuff. And it's like just little things. And I, I, I don't I don't remember even telling my parents, but uh, it's powerful to do all this work to get it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then finding that child, you know, I often tell people, can you find their eyes? Like when I work with them, can you find the eyes of your child? And I have pictures of myself when I was younger. And, you know, I, I look at those. There's a podcast episode I just did recently about the Peter, Peter Gabriel song, In Your Eyes. And I think he's actually singing that song to himself. So if you look at it, if you look at the lyrics that way and you have a picture of your younger self while you listen to that song, I defy you, I defy you not to have some tears. Well, we know what's going to be the outro song now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, That's a, that's a classic. That's a classic. Yeah. And it's such an interesting song too. So I get people to listen to the live version, which is 11 minutes and 34 seconds long, as opposed to the recorded version, which is like five minutes, because he starts, he starts it by saying, you know, accepting all I've, I've done and said, he, you know, I want to stand and stare again. I want to be able to find that younger version of me. Wow. And that's the connection, you know, that, that we miss because 
you know, as adults, we don't want to go back to the child. Like as an adult, you may not want to go back to that child sitting at the table by himself because it's painful, right? So, and then the child needs that connection so much, but as adults, we push that child away. So the child doesn't trust us and we don't trust the child. The <laughs> adult doesn't. So you're in this sort of dichotomy where you can't, you can't heal, you can't connect because we don't want to go back and feel that pain. And then the child looks at us as adults and says, you know, why aren't you helping me? Why isn't anyone helping me? What about me? That's what the child says. So we have to find that child. As woo-woo and ethereal as it sounds, you know, as a, a medical doctor and a neuroscientist, talking about inner child stuff is is pretty out there for the way I was trained. But usually, like if I'm talking to a group of doctors or or, you know, scientists, I will rarely use the term inner child. I'll always use the term younger self because it, it kind of freaks them out. And the weird thing is the people that I find that get most freaked out by the inner child, oh, the inner child is a bunch of crap, whatever, are the ones that have the most inner child damage. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of funny so how it all works. Well, it's so uncomfortable. They're like, get it away from me. Yeah. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. No, it's like, come on, let's go. Let's move towards it. Mm -hmm. Let's heal. Um, everyone, everyone's childhoods is out of their control. Right. And Pretty some, much, yeah. Some, well, yeah, some have um, had some abusive childhoods and some may have had good upbringings, but there's things down the family tree that we may not know totally. because of what we've learned. Right. There's a quote that you've said that really hit me. If you abuse, abandon or neglect a child, the child doesn't stop loving the parents. They stop loving themselves. Please dive into that. Yeah, it's not mine. I mean, I've changed it a little bit from that okay. but it's not my quote specifically but i i say it in a lot of my podcasts because that's what happens very impactful yeah yeah because what happens is that you know if the if shit goes down in the hood in your in your home um kids have this tendency to blame themselves because they can't blame the parent because the parent's involved in their survival so they can't blame the parent so if something is going on in the house that's not very good the child blames themselves and then there's a lot of blame, self-blame the child has for the for the problems of the family. And then they do this thing called jabs. They take jabs at themselves. And this is a, an acronym I, I invented. It's called jabs, judgment, abandonment, blame, and shame. So that's what we do to ourselves as children. We judge, abandon, blame, and shame ourselves. Right. So when you do that, you split from yourself. And when, when the child splits from themselves from the inside, it creates a tremendous amount of alarm in their system. And unless that child is shown that they don't have to be judged, that they're not going to be abandoned, they're not to be blamed, and they're not to be shamed, that energy keeps growing. And, right. and we call it the inner critic. Yep. So we, we, and we keep going. And the reason why we can't heal is because we keep criticizing ourselves. We keep taking these jabs at ourselves. So if, if we need to, to connect with each other to heal, connect with ourselves to heal, and we're constantly judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming ourselves, we're never going to heal. It's so true. It's finding that connection within ourselves. You know, and I, really though, it's, um, yeah, it is. I, I, I really believe that like there's so many people walking around in today's world where they're dealing with the stuff they don't understand how they feel. They don't mm -hmm. understand this stuff. And it, I think it's so important to do the work on ourselves. That way we can take care of ourselves and heal because no one else is going to do it for us. That's true. You know, I did, a, did a podcast called there's no, no one's coming to save you. And I think there's, there's a part in all of us as human beings that if we don't get our needs met as children, that we just have this assumption that some person, some magical other as, as Hollis would call it, some magical other is going to come along and fulfill our needs that weren't fulfilled when we were younger. And that becomes a trauma bond. It becomes codependency. It becomes all these, all these different things. And I think a lot of us with anxiety, we're just born sensitive. You know, we we're just born as sensitive individuals, highly sensitive people. I'm not that crazy about that term, but, but really sensitive. And, you know, others of us have in, inherited family trauma as well. We inherited the wounds of our, our parents and grandparents and way before that, which have nothing to do with us. But it's still in us as well. My friend Mark Willen wrote this wonderful book called It Didn't Start With You, which talks about these wounds that our families experience that gets handed down from you know child to generation to generation to generation. And we don't even realize. 
You know, I was saying to my wife last night, and I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on this program and it's driving me a little crazy. And uh, I said, you know, I have this tremendous need to be seen and also this tremendous need to be invisible. So it's like, there's part of me that wants to be seen, that wants yeah. to show what I know and that kind of, but there's also a part of me that's just tremendously afraid of it as well, which I think came from kind of my bullying when I was in school mm -hmm. and in different grades, not all the way through school, but in different grades. You know, so there's part of me that really wants to be seen and there's part of me that's just really afraid of it. So as I get close to finishing, this happened with the book, it happens yeah. with every project that I come out with. And she said that to me, like, like, every time you get close to putting this thing out, your body goes into complete revolt because you know you're going to be seen. And then there's a part of me that just love to be seen. So that dichotomy is what creates a lot of angst in me, for sure. Yeah, thank you for opening up about that. I want to tell you about a conversation I had with my dad the other sure. night. Because sure. I'm very, I've been very passionate about this stuff, learning about the, you know, the family bloodline and like how things have worked before sure. me. Good. And uh, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, how was it growing up with your own dad? Like, how did he show up for you? I just yeah. straight up. Just it's a great question. Up. And I just went for it. And he says, you know what? Grandpa was always, we call him Opa because it's, yeah, you know, my grandma's German. Um, Opa would always, you know, work really hard as a doctor every night. Financially, he was there. And, and I said, yeah, that's, that's good. That's great. But I want to learn, was he emotionally loving, supportive to you? And he goes, there was, let me tell you a story. There was one, there was one day where I, where I went to my dad and, and I said, dad, I, I just want to hear you say, I love you to me. I want to mm -hmm. be told that. And, and my grandpa was like, <laughs> this is, this is totally him. Uh, he goes, if I got to fucking tell you that I love you, <laughs> something about if uh, i gotta tell you that i love you then that's yeah. that's total bullshit you should already know yeah. that right and what he implied was that him him being there financially and supporting the family was enough and um he my dad was looking for that need so he would yeah. go to his mom for that and yeah. that's where oma showed up um but there's things that we look for and need as children to um get that emotional love and support and i'm just learning because i want to be able to start a trend of doing all the right healthy things for my own future family with mm -hmm. my own kids. Good. And uh, even for my, my own family with my siblings and parents, you know, there's all sorts of things. And that's why I do all the work today is just to not only do all that for them, but most importantly for myself, because that's, that's important, you know? Yeah. And just the awareness that you, you know, just the last few sentences there, I know that you will be a good dad. I know that you will be good in your relationships because you have the awareness of that. But most males don't, right? You know, and and it's not it's not bred in us as men to to relish our relationships. We're much more career focused. Uh, if you look at the STEM fields, you know, men are much more interested in things, and women are more interested in people. Now that's a generalization, but it's kind of true. So it really to 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 be a man who's vulnerable and open isn't it's hard it's hard because you know as much as society says oh you should be vulnerable we'll support you and that kind of stuff society really doesn't want to see vulnerable men in a lot right. of ways right so so we're getting these mixed messages and i feel bad for men these days because there's so many yeah. mixed messages out there that you know we can't follow this we you know we can't be vulnerable and be sexually attractive at the same time and you know it's Rollo to Massey's work which originally when I read The Rational Male you know it's like I, I wanted to hate it but I wound <laughs> up just loving it because it was just it just rang so true on so many levels and it's not anti-women it's just that you know women they put out a certain ideal as to what they want and it's really actually not what they want a lot of the time so it's really coming out like what what's your role as a male? I think the best thing you can do is is like you said at the start of this whole thing today talking is being having that connection to your younger self so that you don't need it so much from the outside. Because I think what we do is if we don't get our needs met in a in sort of an adaptive, you know, healthy way, we go men typically go for alcohol or right. you know drugs or or whatever. It's it's just we can't we can't metabolize our feelings in such a way that 
we feel good about it. So we wind up numbing it, just numb, numb, numb. And, yeah. you know, Bill Burr talks about that, like, stuff it down, stuff it down, stuff it down. You know, <laughs> it's like, that's part of it. And I, I think that's why men die earlier. I think that's why men wow. have so much more stress because there's no outlet. We're not allowed to have an outlet. And that's why I love seeing, you know, men's groups starting up and just being yeah. able to be vulnerable within that place. And I think that's going to be, Re, the probably the most healing for men is to be able to be around other men because we live in this competitive world where we're unconsciously always competing with other men and i think as you get older you kind of let that go a little bit but it's still kind of it's still kind of in us so can we uh, find that men are actually supportive instead of uh, instead of competitors right and how can we compete with ourselves though instead of other people what do you mean? Tell I'm me saying, more about that. You said, you said that men com compete with each other. Yeah. I'd rather compete with myself than other men is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I would say come alongside, you know, work together with the younger version of you. It doesn't have to be the yeah. child in you, but it can be the 21 year old, yeah. like work together, exactly. um, be supportive instead of like, because a lot of times I think with males, we drive ourselves and it works. You know, I drove right. myself to become a doctor and a professional stand-up comedian and a yoga teacher and all this stuff. And it worked, but at what cost? You know, it was like, I was, it was like, there's the carrot and the stick, right? So, you know, that story about the donkey and there's a carrot and a stick, you either put yeah. a carrot in front of him or you hit him with a stick. <laughs> and, and uh, when you're younger, you know, being hit with a stick, being coached, you know, like you got to do this, big boys don't cry, keep going, like go hard yeah. is good. But after a while, if you, if there's no carrots in your life, you're going to burn out and you're going to yeah. start using alcohol. You're going to start using drugs because you can't just use sticks to move forward in the world. It just won't work. That's right. No doubt. Hey, I want to I want to bring up something. I actually I, I didn't bring up the most important part in that story with my dad. What right. I did, what I did was I went to him at the end and I said, Dad, I want to be able to speak to you and your child, the child in you and just say that I love you and you are good enough. You know, because that's important. Yeah, I, I, I don't. How think did that go? How did that go? Corey? He really, he, he loved it. He, yeah, he, good. He took it all good. in, and yeah, and good. that's like to have your son do that to you. Probably like interesting <laughs> for him, but um, I think it's something he's never experienced, and that's right. something and I want to get. Since then, has he been more? you know, overtly loving to you? He's always been loving to me, though. Okay, that's good. the thing. Yeah, he's always okay. been loving to me. Yeah, yeah. But because um, I think if we give permission, like I think a lot of with with males, especially is like giving permission. Look, look, it's OK. Like, that's why I like men's group so much is it's like, look, it's OK to crack here. It's OK to break down here. Right. This is where you're supposed to do it. So when you give a man permission, it, it kind of erases a lot of those unconscious blocks to connection that are killing men. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, the, it's the normal thing to do to not express yourself with your feelings and emotions as a man. I think that's bullshit. I think it's, I think it's a big deal if you can be sensitive. I think it is. Because you can feel. I, I think it is. And I think it's the healthiest way to live. It's just that you have to, you have to pick the people you can be sensitive with. I think that's kind of the way that I would, that I would put it is you have to pick the people that you have to, you can be, you know, really open and sensitive with because, and, and Neufeld talks about that too. You know, he says that sometimes what these schools will do is they'll have these sort of open days where people will, you know, come up and say, you know, I was bullied and, you know, I'm bullied in this school and I'm I'm ostracized and that kind of thing. And then for that day, everybody circles around them and they're great. And but after that, they get ridiculed for their vulnerability. So, you know, I think it's just really knowing testing the waters how vulnerable can you be and then more importantly find a crew like find people yeah. that you can be vulnerable with right because that it's going to extend your life by 10 years you know yeah. if you keep it if you stuff it all down if you find some sort of way of drinking it away or taking medications or getting addicted to porn or whatever it is you know it shortens your life it really does right. and and it shortens the quality of your life as well I agree with you with that, with protecting your own energy. But I yeah. think I think everyone should always be able to just be themselves, though, no matter what, with anyone. And I think that's a fair statement. You know, I think that's a fair statement. I think it's just there are people out there who are wounded and right. who right. won't who won't who won't hold your heart the way it should be. So I think it's just you know trusting your instincts as well. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah, it is important to, to be open and you know and vulnerable with people, but also just 
you know, be aware that there's some people that aren't going to be gentle with your heart. No doubt. I understand that. And I think for me, I've learned to separate myself with other people because it could be a reflection of how they feel about themselves and it might be uncomfortable for them to take in someone else's feelings and emotions. Of course. Right. Of course. I'm learning. <laughs> well, clearly you're sensitive, intuitive, Corey, or else you wouldn't be doing this work, right? So, right. so it's just being really aware of how you can best use that and how right. you can best you know, maintain your own chi, maintain your own energy right. and keep, keep with your vision, you right. know, just keep your vision in mind and just keep using that to ground yourself. Love that. I want to bring up one, another thing too, and that's conscious communication in a relationship. I think this stuff's important to talk about. Sure. Um, you know, it's being able to hold two realities in one. Yeah. What's your thoughts on all that stuff? Yeah. I mean, I think when you, when you fight with your partner, and and I've said this to so many people is that like, you know, your eight year old is fighting with their eight year old. And I have a picture of Cynthia when she's about nine years old in the living room. And whenever I whenever we have a fight, I kind of go back and, and look at that picture. It's like, you know, this is who you're fighting with, right? You're fighting with an eight year old <laughs> and I'm an eight year old, too. Right. So that's what happens. And then and then we lose our, our rational prefrontal cortex and our ability to sort of stay grounded because we go back, you know, if you were neglected as a child and then you perceive that you're being neglected by your partner, not that that's the case in my case, but, you know, I've seen this with, with people, yeah. whatever your childhood wound is, your partner's going to bring up that wound. And if they happen to have the same wound or they have a kind of a stick in that same wound, if they know how to like poke at it, it just drops you back into being an eight-year-old and you're going to behave like an eight-year-old. And then you're going to stick them and they're going to go back to their eight-year-old. And then there's two eight-year-olds battling it out and it's not going to go well. Right. It's working through those triggers. Yeah. Right. And just sort of seeing and just recognizing I am dealing with a nine-year-old right now. If I had a nine-year-old girl in front of me who was, who was saying this to me, right. how would I react to her? Would I, would I raise my voice? Would I be aggressive? It's like, right. no, no. You kind of say, Hey, you know what? I see, I see your point. I see why you're upset. You know, and, and we don't have to fix anything as men too. Like right. just acknowledging that, yeah. you know, I see you're upset. I don't know what's going on with you, but I, you know, you can tell me more about it. I can see that this is really bothering you. You don't have to fix it. I love that you just brought that up because I look at that and I think, how can I comfort and validate that little girl, whoever I'm with? Yeah. And think about that. Cause we don't think about that stuff in relationships. Well, I have a daughter. You know, right. Leandra, who's like Leandra's 37 now. Yeah. So it's it's like we have a pretty adult relationship. Yeah. But, you know, when she was younger and she'd have been having a hard time with something, uh -huh. you know, she'd call me and say, you know, I want to talk about this, but I want listening dad. I don't want doctor dad because doctor dad jumps in and fixes everything. Right. Yeah. And she just wants listening dad. And to this day, like if she's upset about something, like she's got two, I've got two grandkids, like five and three. And if she's upset about something, I'll say to her right off the top, it's like, do you want doctor dad or do you want listening dad? <laughs> and uh, sometimes she wants doctor dad because the kids are, you know, have ear infections or something like that. But yeah. a lot of times she just wants listening dad. It's, it's, I love that she puts it that way. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> very so direct. Awesome. It's very yeah. direct. And if I, if yeah. I, uh, you know, default into Dr. Dad, she'll say, you know, and there'll be a little pause. It's like, I really just want listening dad. And it's like, and then it's like, oh, of course, of course I did it again. You know, cause it's so much a part, yeah, part of my personality to, to, to doctor and fix and that kind of thing. So it's my go-to, it's my default, right. especially if I'm stressed, that's where I will go. But, but, um, and it's, it's a metaphor for just what, what does other people need from you? And asking them questions, because I think as men, sometimes we kind of take charge rather than just, you know, sit back. I remember right. one of my, one of my medical mentors in med school, you know, he said, uh, you know, sometimes when you see somebody and they may be in pain or whatever, it's just, don't do, don't just do something, stand there. Cause the, the typical saying is don't just stand there, do something. But he would say it the opposite is that don't just do something, stand there, like wait and wait and give them time to kind of. What is it? Because the more information you can get without jumping in and fixing, the better answer, the better response you're going to get, and the more emotional connection you're going to draw. Right. And there's a lot of parents that, that will say this, and I've heard this before with my own. <laughs> They'll say, well, we just want to tell you the truth. 
we just want to tell you like it is and what what's all about it's like no i just want to be heard and understood and supported with however i feel yeah that's important and asking for more you know asking for more it never hurts if somebody is upset even with you like you did this you didn't come home when you said you did yeah. you know it's like well you know i can see that that's really bothering you like I'm open. Can you, can you tell me more about how you're feeling about that? Or can you tell me more about, you know, your process when I wasn't coming home? Like, tell me more about it and draw more out of them because a lot of times they just want to be seen, you know, it's like, right. they feel like you didn't come home because you don't like them or you didn't, because our relationship isn't going on or whatever. And that might be true. That might be true, but just, it never hurts to ask for more information. And, and as men, we don't tend to do that. We tend to sort right. of take small amounts of information that we have and then we make a plan out of the small amount of information we have and i'm saying that there's more information there you know just just draw it out they want to talk about it typically i'm, I'm using the, your typical binary male female dynamic but yeah but you know that's most of us right and I, like i said the biggest thing is um like you said listening um stepping into the reality and just being like hey i can see why you feel that way yeah you know what that's i mean such it's such a, it's such a critical phrase, you know, you don't have to agree with them. You know, it's just, you know, I don't necessarily agree with you because I said I was going to be late, Yeah. but, but, you know, but tell me more about how you're, how, how you're processing this, you know, tell me more about that. Um, without it sounding like, you know, the, the your typical psychiatrist, how do you feel about that? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's really about, you know, genuinely asking them like, look, I see, honey, I, I see that this is really bothering you. Right. Um, can you tell me a little more about what's going on with you? And the more you can sh sort of show them that you understand their point of view and all the ne hostage negotiators, all the, the communications experts, they all say the same thing. It's like, get more information. Right. And, and that's what you're saying is helping them under, you know, you, you just, you understanding how they feel is just the most important thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, and that, that's for, for females, especially in your traditional sort of non, that's kind of 80% of what they want. It's just right. to be seen and heard at that point rather mm -hmm. than, you know, kind of fixed, you know, right. a lot of times we, we go to fix them. Right. Cause I think on some level, that's what we wanted when we were younger. We wanted to get fixed. We wanted that sort of stuff to be there and it wasn't. So we never really learned that emotional skill of, yeah. Can we wait? Can you just wait in this environment, even though it's uncomfortable? Right. And I feel that every gender deserves that. Yeah, I think Maybe. so too. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I, and I feel that, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's hard for people to really help someone feel seen, you know, and I'm learning all that. I think part of it too, Dr. Kennedy is emotional regulation. Yeah. You know? Well, if you can't see yourself, you know, like that old saying, you know, your relationship with other people can only be as good as your relationship with yourself. If you can't see yourself, if emotionally you're driving yourself too hard, and this is true with men as well, it's very difficult to see, to be emotionally soft and connected to other people if you're driving yourself with a stick every day. That's really interesting. I, I've i learned too, is like, I mean, people that, that, that tension and conflict in any relationship, it's so important to take the time away. I've always said, because it's, how are you ever going to understand someone if you're in the heat of the moment? Well, that's tough. true. Yeah. I mean, if you're triggered, if you're in fight or flight, um, you actually shut off the rational part of your brain and the loving part of your brain too, you know, and you move into survival brain and survival brain preferentially sees threat. And if there's no threat there, you'll tend to make it up. So that's the problem with trying to have uh, an argument while you're both in fight or flight because you've both lost your rational abilities. Right. And this is the, this is why it's so important to practice emotional regulation when you yep. get upset, especially with your partner, because then you can actually say to them, even though they're accusing you, you said you'd be home at 10 and it's midnight and yeah. you know, I'm the whatever, whatever. It's very difficult to be on the other end of that and not get worked up and be able to kind of just say, you know what, you're right. I did say that I would be home at this time. I haven't, things got out of my way. Things right. got out of the way on me. Like, tell me more about how you feel. It's really difficult when it's you tough. are, when you're, when you feel like you're being attacked. Right. Coming together and understanding one another is huge. And um, I want that for everyone, you know. It would be a nicer world. It would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> Give you that. It'll be a nicer world. 
Yeah. And I've learned all this stuff. This is so, uh, all this is so important to me and I become very passionate about it. So it's nice to have a conversation with someone who understands sure. this stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but, anxiety is my, my jam. Like that's right. But it's really about, you know, personal relationships. That's yeah. really what anxiety is about. And mostly the relationship, what, what do you do inside of yourself to, to distance yourself from, from attaching, you know, right. and, and chances are you're doing the exact same thing with your external relationships as well. So if you can understand and heal your relationship with yourself, your relationships with other people are going to get so much better. Can I ask you what type of attachment style you've grown up to have? I think I'm a mix of, of anxious and avoidant. I think those are two. I don't think I'm quite the disorganized, although every once in a while I get there and there's some secure in there as well. You know, there's some, yeah. so, so I don't, I think people have this illusion that, you know, you're one attachment style. And I think that there's a bunch, you know, there's, there's, you know, you may be, you know, if you grew up with like sexual abuse, you're probably have a, a primarily disorganized attachment style because there was no connection there. But if you, you know, grew up like I did, you know, there was some connection there. It was disorganized on some level. But I would say if I, I had to tell you, it would be primarily avoidant. That's my primary uh, attachment style. Um, there's some secure in there and then there's some anxious as well. So uh, that's, that's you know, using those, those you know, Ainsworth and, and uh, uh, terms, that's, that's what I would classify myself as. And would you say that you're still dealing with all of those right now and just managing it? Or are you fully into a secure attachment now? It depends on the day. It depends on depends, the day. Depends on the day. Depends on the situation yeah. too. You know, yep. because of my my experience with my father. You know, if I feel like someone's emotionally withdrawing from me, that triggers the fuck out of me. Fuck yeah! Right. You know. So, yeah. but I'm aware of it. So I know that that's what's happening. Still, though, sometimes just being aware of something isn't enough. But I know how to put my hand on my chest. I know how to breathe. I know how to do some breath work. I know right. how to, you know, connect myself, put my feet flat on the floor. I know how to orient to, to, to pleasure, orient to my breath, orient to that stuff. I know how to do all that stuff. It's just that whole thing I was saying earlier is that, you know, you, you paralyze the rational loving part of your brain when you get into fight or flight and you move into a survival state. And in a survival state, you do things where you can shatter relationships. You can shatter your relationship with yourself. So it's really important to know, you know, where am I on the scale right now? Am I still present? Am I still connected? Or am I starting to dissociate? You know, am I starting to move into a fight or flight state? So it depends on what's going on with yeah. me in general as to which. Because again, I don't think they're rigid um, states you know, secure, avoidant attachments, all that stuff. I think that they're, they're flowy. Like they, they, depending on the situation, you know, and if, yeah. if it's, if, if like, I don't have much of a problem with what, well, you know, what is it, something I don't have a problem with too much? Um, you know, people that on, on Instagram or whatever that, that, you know, call me out or something like that. Yeah. I don't have much of a problem with them. That doesn't really trigger me that much. Right. But if someone starts to tell me what to do, Oof. That really triggers me. Yeah. So I know that that one thing will sort of set me off, and the other thing will be like, ah, whatever. You right. know. So it's just it's knowing what your triggers are, and and practicing in yeah. advance what you're gonna do if if these things come up. Right. And uh, perfectly said. Managing your own triggers. Yeah. And and the last thing I ever want to do is have someone take that on. You know, the projections, the overthinking, the bad thoughts, whatever it is. Our own anxiety stays with us and we have to work through it, like you said. And, you, and you're self-aware and you know what to do. Yeah, but we do need other people. I mean, we, no one does this alone. No one right. feels alone. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things that that's the dichotomy is that we have to connect with ourselves, but we need other people to show us how to do that. I love that. Yeah. The, the connection's always important to be aware of and to have within ourselves and it will reflect on all those other relationships, but I agree with you. We need connection with other people. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hey, the last thing I want to bring up today is your book, Anxiety okay. RX, a new prescription for anxiety relief from the doctor who created it. Would love for you. There Yay. we go. Yes, there it is. There it is. Please uh, describe what this, I mean, it's about anxiety, but describe it. Tell yeah, me about well, it's, it's about my own journey with anxiety, along with the neuroscience that I've learned and a lot of things that I understand about the brain and the body and how it all fits together. And just 
different stories in it, you know, things like inability to receive. One of the reasons why people are anxious is they, they never really learn how to receive well as children. You know, they never really got the love they needed or um, their ego dragon got in there and tried to overprotect them. You know, the thing about the ego is that anything that ever hurt you, it will make sure that you never do again. So if you're speaking in front of your grade eight class and you drop your presentation and everyone laughs, the ego is going to tell you, we're never speaking in front of people again. We're yeah. never doing that again. Like that's it. And your body will revolt, which is one of the reasons I think I'm going through now is because putting myself out there is kind of like that old, you know, shade of that old bullying. Because if I'm hidden, if I'm off on my own, like you said, you used to go, mm -hmm. no one bullies you if you're on your own. Right. But as soon as you put yourself in front of other people, and I did that for 15 years as a stand-up comic. So, you know, as soon as you put yourself in front of other people, it creates that. So the book is really about partly about my journey, partly about some of my patients' journeys, but it's really about this understanding that anxiety has much more to do with old alarm right. that's stuck in your physiology than the psychology of your mind. Your mind is just really reflecting this old pain that's still in you, um, that it's really the child wanting to be seen, heard, loved, and protected. And if you can show that child in you, find them first, which is what I'm, I'm creating in this program, a way of finding that alarm because that alarm, I do believe, that's in our body is our younger self. Mm -hmm. Finding the alarm, um, treating it with love and compassion, and developing a relationship with that child who didn't get their needs met, and trying to meet their needs now in a way they so badly needed back then. So that's really what the book is about. I've got some humor in there as well. You know, I do the odd Schwarzenegger impersonation and impersonation in the uh, in the audio book. You know, open the door. There's a bomb in there. You know, it's like. <laughs> So it's uh, yeah. it's kind of fun. I really enjoyed doing the the audiobook, narrating the audiobook, and you know, the audiobook's getting very close, if not today, to hit twenty thousand copies. So that's I'm pretty excited about that. Awesome. Yeah. And you have so they can find that book on Amazon. Yep, it's called Anxiety RX. So and RX for some people who are listening in different parts of the world. Um, I just found this out like recently that RX in North America, of course, everyone knows means prescription. But in different parts of the world, RX doesn't mean prescription. So they, they're they like, you know, people are saying, what does RX mean? And it's like, well, I was a doctor for 20 years. So <laughs> RX means prescription. Right. So, and even the new program is, you know, your mind body prescription for healing anxiety. So I, I have a lot of prescriptions in there. I wrote thousands of them as a doctor. So, so it's like I, I prescriptions I'm pretty, I'm pretty familiar with. Absolutely. Uh, you also have a podcast too. Yep. Called Anxiety Rx Podcast. You know, not a lot of uh, ingenuity there figuring that out. But uh, yeah, I, it's mostly me. I did one segment a few weeks ago with my daughter, Leandra, because she'd suffer from anxiety um, right. in her life too. So just just the trials and tribulations of the father anxiety, kind of father-daughter anxiety couple <laughs> that we had together, you know, just, uh, you know, because her mother... Leandra's mother is very level, very stable, very emotionally balanced. You <laughs> right know, in the but, middle. But, but she and I are much more sensitive. You know, my daughter and I are much more sensitive. Or much and that's more okay. Into the, I, oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. So it's uh, it's one of those things that we, we talked about. She talked about growing up with me and how I would go through really anxious phases and how she felt about it, too, because it knocked her off balance as sure. well. So. So it, it was a nice, it was definitely a nice podcast to do. So yeah, Anxiety Rx book, Anxiety Rx podcast. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. I was just at the cold plunge facility and um, the guy who runs it, he put your podcast on. So I was in the cold oh, fucking wow. water. I'm freezing my okay. ass off and I'm listening to you. So it was really nice, you know, and he, nice. he, he enjoyed listening to you. Which one uh, was that? Do you remember? I think it was the latest one. Okay. It might've been. Yeah, I'm trying to figure. The latest one is basically, I think, uh, on on the new program that I'm putting out hopefully in, in the next week. And uh, it's really about, it's really about healing the unconscious roots. Like there's right. so many things out there. There's so many books out there about how to think differently. It's like, you can't fix a feeling problem with a thinking solution, dude. Like you just can't do it. It just doesn't, you can help it. It'll help you cope, but it won't heal. So you have to go with those unconscious roots. And that's really what the program is about. There's a yoga nidra in there. There's there's a couple of meditations in there yeah. that just kind of show you how to connect with that younger version of yourself. We can't ever go externally to find that connection within us and to heal. That's true. But uh, but it doesn't stop us from trying. You know, sure. I see so many people looking for external, including myself. 
looking right. for external validation, thinking sure. that, you know, if We're I have human. this much money or if I have this, if I'm, you know, I'm heralded as some sort of, you know, anxiety guru that this is going to heal me. Now yeah. it it's nice and it's nice to be validated for your own particular passion in the world. But I, I think that's why a lot of movie stars and people wind up killing themselves is because they realize, Hey, I have everything. I've got the beautiful house. I've got the amazing partner. I've got all this stuff and yeah. I'm still unhappy. It's true. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. I have people that have in, in, in my practice, you know, that I, that I see in a way uh, that are very successful financially, but very unhappy. No kidding. And I it don't mean to laugh, but it's just, no, you know, it's true, in our society, we think that, you know, if you've got the boat and the car and the, and the spouse and all that kind of stuff, you've got to be happy. And it's like, mm, you know, money won't make you happy. It won't make you sad. Money won't make you sad, but it, uh, it definitely won't make you happy. And I'm not here to shame anyone, but it, some, some of those people are the most miserable people. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. You right. know, the people I see, I see people in finance, you know, people that are, that right. money is their kind of main energy. Right. You know, it can be a very hollow existence. You can have a ton of money, but if you don't have that ability to connect with other people, uh, which I'm not saying all finance people do, but some definitely do. Um, when money is their main goal, it's, you know, it's, it's a very transactional existence. Right. No kidding. And, and I want to bring up one more thing. Sure. Um, external validation does feel good. We can it does. That. We're human. Yeah. You know? Dopamine, all that stuff. Of course. Mes the mesolimbic dopamine circuit, baby. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, and I wanted to be vulnerable with you too. I've had an anxious attachment style, especially in my romantic relationships. Okay. Yeah. And you know, I remember the last relationship I was in, she constantly, she went overboard to help me with reassurance and validation. Mm. The thing is, that's great. It, it feels good for an hour, but you're right back at the same place if you don't take care of yourself, right? Yeah. So I know for me, I have to give it to myself every day and I have been. So just want to point that out. Everyone has their attachment style, but it's important to find that connection within us and to heal. And um, yeah, just want to help people, you know? Yeah, it's fine. It's really knowing yourself and being okay with knowing yourself. And right. I think, you know, Hollis, uh, Harlow Hollis has written some amazing books. Um, he uses multisyllabic words that even I don't understand half the time. But he said, you know, the first 40 years, you know, they're just a trial. They're just a trial for the yeah. last 40, right? It's just like you learn so much, you know, it's it's such an, an irony that we wind up getting married in our 20s and making all these career decisions in our 20s and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we don't really, you know, our brains don't fully develop until we're in our late 20s. So it's, it's wild. It's a funny human existence. It really is. No kidding. Hey, at the end of this episode, I want to say this. You inspire me. Okay. What you do for people, helping them understand themselves, your own experiences, being vulnerable and open. You're very well spoken. And uh, I enjoy listening to you. But um, these type of conversations, like I've said, are very, I'm very passionate about. I really love talking about this stuff because I have fallen in love with taking care of my well-being. I've said that before. And um, it's cool to be on the same wavelength and uh, a massage and cold plunge always helps before a podcast. That's Let's kidding. remember that, right? Made me a little, it, it fogged me a little bit. Like it, I'm, I wasn't as sharp as I normally would, but you know what? I'm, I'm more feeling than I would have been normally. And sometimes right. my feeling gets in the way of my intellect, which right. in a good way, but you know, like there's part of me that's, that's, that I, 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 I get into this sometimes bad habit of giving more information than transformation. I give more information yeah. than emotion. So I'm aware of it, but uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to be a little more emotional. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And when you feel out of tune, the fact that you're self-aware of it, you get right back in and mm -hmm. I'm here with you. I, I, I understand that. I'm always self-aware each hour of the day. So I uh, appreciate you, man. And Hey, are you, uh, you're in uh, Vancouver, right? You said, Victoria. So Victoria? I, I, okay. I bounce back and forth, but, but, uh, I like Victoria a lot more than Vancouver. Vancouver is very busy for me, for my sense it of is. nervous system. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's a lot more calm in Victoria. It really is. Hey, go Oilers, go Connor McDavid. I have to put sure. that out too, because you're, you're rooting for him. How to say that. Yep. All right, man. Great talking. And, um, this meant a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks Corey. Anytime.